Good morning. <laughs> that woke everybody up. <laughs> wow. Wow. I'm sorry to wake you up like that. I had no idea the mic was really on. Um, this is this is really fantastic. How fantastic to see all of you here. Welcome. Good morning. And um, I'm going to be really brief because we have an action-packed morning for you. But allow me to read through some necessary items for you to hear. Other than the fact that my name is Ann Blodgett, <laughs> um, I'm honored to be the current Wentworth Watershed Association president. The board and staff join me in welcoming you all today. Just a quick news flash about the Wentworth Watershed Association. The 87-year-old Lake Wentworth Association and the 20-year-old Lake Wentworth Foundation combined forces earlier this year, uniting similar missions into one organization in our watershed. A fact sheet is available at our information table over there, along with future program offerings. And then there's also a sponsor table over there, uh, so you can check out our sponsors. Judy Gosby will be happy to help you. Um, so why are we here? Obviously, water is central to all life, but in this community, it touches us in so many influential and important ways. It's also our livelihood economically and emotionally. Some of us have been vacationing here or making a living here because of our lakes. Some of us for, uh, some of us for entire lives. Many are more recent converts, but are just as passionate. And thank you to those of you who stopped me on the street and said, I love the water. It's so important to me. I know how lucky our family has been to enjoy almost 90 years, that's not me, but 90 years on Lake Wentworth <laughs> with grandparents, cousins, children, and now grandchildren. Water brings us together in so many ways, just like today. Lots of us have noticed changes in our water. We see milfoil in Back Bay, we hear of cyanobacteria, and are reminded often of the impact of stormwater runoff and are concerned for future generations. In addition, we heard of wells going dry last year and drinking water issues in other parts of New Hampshire. All are serious wake-up calls. Today, we have an opportunity to build our combined understanding and work towards community-based solutions. Today, we are joining forces with each other, the town officials, and local experts to conserve this remarkable gift we enjoy. Just like the successful public-private partnerships around town, like the one that made this very room possible, you will learn of the work that is being done by our town supported by grants and local nonprofit organizations. But we need more. We need everyone on board. How did we get here to this summit? Through discussions with Don Kretschmer over the last few years, he has been a tremendous catalyst and inspiration. His work as a limnologist takes him to many lakes who also recognize changes and challenges. We are blessed to have him in our community, and thank you, Don. So I, I just want to give him a round of applause. Before I turn over the program to Sam, there are so many to thank in our community and beyond. Thank you to the Water Summit community who toiled through the winter to bring you this event. And I'd like to give them a round of applause. Thank you also to Bob Cole and Bobby Budman of the Wentworth Watershed Association Office who have been so instrumental in producing today. Uh, you'll hear later from Bob on the panel. And as for critical community support, we all need to offer special thanks to the Wolfboro Fund, the Kate Memorial Fund, and Edward Jones for their generous funding that made this programming possible. Also, we want to thank the sponsors and partners and supporters who joined the Wentworth Watershed Association in bringing you this event. Please thank them if you get a chance.
I now call your attention to today's program, which most of you have, um, to read of the many accomplishments of Sam Evans Brown. We are so fortunate to have him here this morning. He will lead us through the issues, the implications, and the opportunities as he introduces our speakers and moderates our morning. Many of you listen to Sam on NHPR, the program Outside In, and you've probably heard him in, a, in many other airwaves. I've also heard that his podcasts are terrific, so there's a plug for you, Sam. I even op opened up a New Hampshire magazine recently and saw his beautiful wife in his off-the-grid house. Um, thank you, Sam, and our esteemed speakers and panel for leading us through this crucial topic as we seek and plan solutions together. Now here's Sam, and let's get on with the summit. Thank you all. So I'll try to be really quick here. We're, we're uh, you know, packing a lot in in the morning. But I did want to say really quickly that uh, in my job where I'm bouncing around from sort of controversy to controversy, challenge to challenge, it's pretty rare to see, something, see an area where people have found sort of bipartisan consensus. And the land trust movement is one where, where you, you really do see that. The land trust movement continues to be an area in which uh, people from all sides of the political spectrum do come together. And I remember talking to uh, a conservative lobbyist at one point who, who talked about how the National Land Trust Alliance rolls into Washington, D.C. Like, like a conquering army with ranchers and farmers and fishermen and, and environmentalists and bird watchers all as part of their coalition. So I really love to be part, part of, uh, of events that are put on by these land trusts. And uh, I think you guys have something going here. Um, a note on the, on the agenda, Dr. Rahim is not here today. He had a bicycle accident this week. He has a concussion and uh, is not going to be making it. We heard that just a day or two ago. So, so fortunately though, Dr. Ball ba Ballestero says that he can expand or contract his uh, presentation to fit any time slot. Uh, and, and so we've given him a little extra time, uh, which I think it, you know, it will, he'll, he'll happily fill. Um, so I'm going to cue him up here. Dr. Ballestero is a hydrologist and water resources engineer. He uh, runs the UNH Stormwater Center, which I've been hearing, hearing about for my, the entirety of my career at NHPR. Uh, he's the former direct, director of the New Hampshire Water Resources Research Center and serves on the New England Interstate Water Pollution and Control Commission. He uh, is the inaugural winner of the Water Resource Innovation Award, which maybe he can tell us about. Uh, but he recognizes the outstanding commitment and dedication to the advancement of water resource management and innovations that help to protect clean, clean water for future generations. So without any further ado, Dr. Ballestero. I, uh, I am also a biker, and when I heard about Dr. Rahim, I did not go biking yesterday just because I dreaded <laughs> calling Don from the hospital saying, you won't believe what happened. So um, months ago, Don and Bob contacted me and asked me to give, give this talk. And uh, they said they wanted a water summit. And I said, well, what, what would you like me to talk about? And they gave me a list. Well, it's on one of the slides. but. I only have a half an hour, and the list would take about 12 to 20 hours to talk about. So I'm going to do my best. And um, <clears throat> as you were just told, I can contract or expand these 700 slides to fit <laughs> whatever time you want. So as far as an overview, <clears throat> this is kind of what I'm going to go through. And um, the big items are climate change, water supply, stormwater management, stream restoration, and then something uh, we kind of call the human dimension. But um, I will always identify when I'm giving you opinion. Opinion is not necessarily fact, as you know. Most of the slides have factual information on it. But when there's opinion, I will certainly let you know. Um, so of course, the first thing we're uh, going to explore is climate change. And um, <clears throat> I'm not going to delve into what caused it. Um, Globally and nationally and even locally, we debated that for 20 to 30 years. 
Whereas the reality is we saw in this region dramatic changes since 1970. So no matter what's causing it, we've got to deal with it. And I think that's the most uh, important message you should take back from the climate change section of this talk. So as far as data, this is what we know is factual. The first slide is global average surface temperatures. And the horizontal axis is time from 1850 to the present. And so you can see that global temperatures have uh, increased over this time period. Sea level has increased. And you know what's interesting about sea level is Right now, we're looking at the last 10 to 30 years, and the slope can change dramatically. And as you extend that out into the future, 200 years, you get this wide swing in what the sea level can do. And when you look at all the potential for the, the ocean to do that, the potential is there. We don't know what's going to happen into the future. But what we do is look at trends. As planners, scientists, engineers, we look at the past. And for at least the near future, we, we have to be able to accommodate what we think is going to be happening. <clears throat> and then the very um, lowest slide on this is the snow cover in the northern hemisphere. And that also seems to be on a decreasing trend, which would kind of mirror what's happening on the um, upper slide with temperature. Now, one of the most important facets of climate change that unfortunately very few people talk about. These are trends, and I know you're not all statisticians, but they're trends in the average. But to describe a variable, there's many other statistics. The average is but one. The other is the standard deviation, how much something can deviate. And what's scary the most about climate change is the standard deviation is getting larger too. And what that means, for example, is we can have a year with no, no snow, like two years ago, and we can have another year we have phenomenal amount of snow, like the year before that. Okay, so again, this is one of the things we're notice, uh, noticing and part of what we identify as climate change. So when people say <clears throat> we've had five 100-year floods in a row or um, look how cold it is today, there's no climate change, it's not getting hotter. The, the deviation or the, the change in what's happening in the weather is actually what's um, very challenging to have to deal with. So this is a map of how storms with large amounts of precipitation have been changing over the period from 1948 to 2006. And so the larger the blue circle that's filled in, the larger and larger the change in extreme precipitation. And again, these are the types of events that would generate large floods. You will notice that there are some circles that are hollow. And so you, there are places in the country where the extreme events are actually decreasing. And that's po certainly possible. Again, these are just trends from data. This is what we see. And again, moving on into the future, what we're trying to understand is, how do we plan for this? Is the infrastructure that we put in the ground today going to be obsolete in five years? Or will it actually be functioning for the next 100 years? <clears throat> so, um, when, when Chicago looked at this, they identified that um, they're seeing very significant design changes and they're trying to accommodate those changes today, uh, today. So whether it's culverts, bridges, road drainage, they're actually planning for much larger precipitation. Um, this one is almost impossible to read because it's in yellow, but um, when you look at New England winter and spring seasons, the first one says we're seeing more winter rain than snow. And, and I give the citations, and I don't know if the uh, Watershed Association, you can certainly post this presentation on your website so people can see it later and you can grab these um, references. The other, uh, the second bullet, earlier melting of the snowpack. The third bullet, March-April air temperatures are, have increased almost one degree. And the March-April air temperatures are, of course, correlated with when you start to get more and more stream flow. And so uh, I'll show another slide, but we're seeing more stream flow in March, less in May, and you know maybe that's not a big issue, to, big, issue, big issue to you living next to a lake, but it might be a big issue to something which normally has a life cycle that starts in May. And so things that are living in, in these uh, natural environments have to also try to accommodate or negotiate these changes. 
So when we look at just the hydrology, the flow of water in our streams or the lake levels that we have, um, Matt Collins with NOAA uh, a few years ago looked at stream flows at USGS gauging stations and identified that yes, in fact, we're seeing larger flood flows. That there's a trend that the 50-year flood or the 100-year flood is getting larger and larger. And again, the very light last bullet on this one is the change that we've seen is since 1970. It's like at 1970, when we look back, that's when we see all these trends happening locally here in New Hampshire, globally in and around that time. So here's a busy scatter plot, but it's basically showing on the horizontal axis the time from the 1800s to the present, and the vertical axis is just the spring date, and the low, uh, lowest value on the vertical axis is March 11th, and the upper axis value is May 30th. The blue and the dots and the blue line is Moosehead Lake up in Maine. <clears throat> and then the other red uh, uh, triangles and the red line is the Darmascotta Lake also up in Maine. But what you generally see is a downward trend and what it's identifying is that these lakes are thawing out a few days earlier compared to what they did decades ago. And we're seeing that in New Hampshire as well, but again, I'm trying to identify that we're not the only ones that may be observing this. So again, uh, if you used to pull in your ice house in, um, in uh, April, maybe you're going to have to start pulling it in in March. Um, if you look at, again, the timing of winter, spring st stream flows, uh, what this is identifying is where you see the red triangles in New England, we're seeing um, that the spring peak stream flows, the runoff season from snowmelt, is happening earlier and earlier and earlier. The, the larger the red triangle, the earlier it is occurring. And if it's actually a blue triangle, which you see some of them out in the Midwest in the lower figure, um, it, it appears that, there, that it's uh, getting a little colder in the Midwest. So again, climate change doesn't hit everybody the same, but we're identifying that we're seeing these uh, trends. So in New England, again, from what Matt Collins was looking at, we're just looking at a plot of the month, uh, the horizontal axis is time in months, January, February, March, and the vertical axis is, is the, uh, basically a statistically significant difference. And what we're seeing where we, you have the blue bars, you're seeing more flows in those months than, com than in the past. And the red bars mean you're seeing less flows. So the, again, the common aim may be four, we're seeing more flow in our streams now in March and April, and we're not seeing as much, say, in May, June, and July. So again, these are trends from the data when we look at long-term data sets. Um, when we look at a, at a stream hydrograph, so this is a plot of stream flow on the vertical versus time of year, and you'll see a solid line and then below it a dashed line. The dashed line is what we call base flow. That's what's coming out of the groundwater and slowly seeping on into streams, and it's what sustains our perennial streams in between when we have storms run off on the surface, and that's what the solid line is. So the dominant amount of stream flow in many streams is actually base flow. Base flow cont controls the water quality, for example, dissolved oxygen, nutrients, total dissolved solids, but it also controls things like temperature. So streams aren't going to freeze in part because they're moving, but also in part because the base flow is actually much warmer groundwater. Typically, the base flow is going to be about the average annual ambient air temperature around here, about 48 degrees. So again, when that comes out, it's not going to freeze immediately, except on some brutally cold and windy days. But when we look at the base flows, again, uh, uh, if you look at this plot, where we're seeing the red triangles, base flows are decreasing. Where we're seeing the blue triangles, base flows are increasing. The larger the triangle, the larger the change. So it looks like in Maine, they're seeing less base flow, and through the rest of New England, we're seeing more, which would kind of go along with, again, it's getting wetter here as well. And so the more rain we get, the more infiltration we get, the more base flow we get. <clears throat> Um, I'll skip that one. So, um, 
peak flows, when we look at flood flows, and there's a whole science on this. Many of you might be familiar with floodplains and delineating floodplains and that we need to get the hydrology first before we can figure out how high the water level comes. Very busy slide, but in essence, on the horizontal axis, you have probability, the percent of time a particular flow is exceeded. So for example, where you have 50%, Half the time, the value on the line is greater than that. Half the time, it's less than that. And on the vertical axis, you have a log scale of discharge, the flow in the river. And these are peak flows. These are the flood flows. So you take the largest flow every year, and then you basically stack them up from largest to smallest, and you start to ask what percentage of the flows are greater than this. For example, 10% of the flows are greater than a certain flow, 90% are less than. So when you have this data, you can pick out what's the five-year flood, what's the 100-year flood. That's the one you typically hear about. If you look at all of the data, and this is for the Quinnipiac River in Connecticut, but you could do this for almost any river in New Hampshire or across New England. From the period 1931 to 2006, that would be using all of the data, and that's the X's. And so you see the black line through that, and... <clears throat> If we went up at that 100-year value, we could see that the black curve crosses at about 200 cubic feet per second. That would be your estimate of the 100-year flood. But if you look at the data pre-1970 and post-1970, the pre-1970 data is the orange triangles. The post-1970 data is the blue triangles. And now if you go up, basically what you see is that the 100-year flood for this one river system has increased 40% over this time period. And again, this is looking backwards. We don't really know what's going to happen as we look into the future, but again, infrastructure we design today can't be static. We have to think about what's going to happen 100 years from now. Should we be estimating the 100-year flood of today and increasing it by 40%? And when we do that, obviously, um, that affects the floodplain. So if you're not in a 100-year floodplain today, and if you look at the dashed red line on this figure, that would have been the 100-year floodplain at this location in the 1980s. Compared to the floodplain today, where you see the blue, you can see there are many other areas that are now in the floodplain. Outside of those areas, we allow development today. But in 50 years, which could be your children or your grandchildren, now all of a sudden they may be in the floodplain. So should we be looking at land use and how we allow land use into the future to try to minimize these types of um, uh, issues? Again, with the uh, flood insurance program in the United States, if you're in a designated flood area, you can buy flood insurance. And basically, if you get flooded out, you get funds back from this program. Basically, the taxpayers are paying you to rebuild. And some places we've paid to rebuild a few times. You know, the question is, are we going to keep doing this? And if the floodplains keep getting larger and larger, you and I are going to pe keep paying more and more. So it seems to be an unsustainable future uh, unless we start to change uh, some of our policies. So coming back to New Hampshire, um, if you look at the Lamprey River, the, I showed you what's happening on the Quinnipiac, um, but this is the Lamprey River in Newmarket. And if you look at <clears throat> the past um, uh, if you look at the entire record of stream flows since 1934, in the last 25 years, 11 of the largest flows in the entire record have happened in the last 25 years. 10 of the largest flows of that record from 1934 to about uh, 2010 have occurred in the last 15 years. So we're seeing this higher frequency. When you hear people say there's been like seven 100-year floods in the last 10 years, it's not really accurate, but we are seeing more floods. And, and philosophically, you can see 100-year floods every year, but not necessarily in the same river. So if you think that all watersheds are random and there's 10,000 watersheds across the U.S., there's, of course, much more than that. If 1% of them, that's what the 100-year flood is, the chance of 1% of a flood equal or higher than that happening any year. 1% of those 10,000 watersheds, you should be having 100, 100-year 100 floods somewhere in the country every year. So they're going to happen, but they shouldn't happen in the same river year after year after year. It's not the 100-year flood anymore.
you're changing the statistics. So that was all factual. Now, you know, there are many, many who are looking at, well, what can we anticipate on into the future? And <clears throat> this is where climate modelers, and there are hundreds of climate models, will take the atmospheric conditions and look at the drivers so temperature and uh, uh, CO2, as well as other greenhouse gases, are all driving what's happening on the climate. And so what the, a lot of these slides come from the International Panel on Climate Change, and uh, there are many, many scenarios that people look at. But from climate modeling into the future, what I have here are the results from 15 of the models that are kind of right in the middle of what all the models are predicting. So again, it's not one person's model, but these 15 models are basically all saying the same thing. And what you'll see in the following diagrams is where you have 80% of these 15 models agreeing on what's happening in the magnitude. So um, for example, <clears throat> If you look at precipitation, and hopefully everybody passed geography, and you know where New England and New Hampshire are in this map, but <laughs> there will be a quiz during the break. Don't laugh. You better start taking notes. And uh, as you know, I'm a professor at UNH. If you would start texting and falling asleep, you'd make me feel at home. So <laughs> it's, I'm not used to people paying attention to me. I, I have to be entertaining. If you uh, look at this, you, you will see that we're expecting 10 to 20% more precipitation into the future in this region. Again, what the majority of these models are saying. Precipitation intensity, the rate at which it comes down, a thunder shower versus a very low um, intensity event, two very different events. And both of those types of events can cause 100-year floods the very intense rains tend to happen over very small areas, a thunder shower. Those can cause the 100-year floods on very small watersheds. Whereas events like Sandy or Irene, which cover enormous areas, in Irene in western New Hampshire only dumped about three to five inches. But on the large watersheds, like the Connecticut River, that's the type of event that creates the 100 to 500 year flood on the large water basins, where you have this enormous footprint and low intensity that occur, uh, happens over one to two, three days. So we see intensity is going to increase. Obviously, if precipitation and precipitation intensity increase, we're going to see runoff increasing. <clears throat> but again, the point I made before, it's the standard deviation and actually the skewness, if you're a real statistical geek, uh, these other parameters which describe properties of variables, um, the variability is increasing. And so even though it's getting wetter, we're going to see longer periods of dry days and hotter days. So the last year, whether or not you remember it, was a record drought in all of New England. We had not seen anything like that before. In fact, the drought just was declared over a few weeks ago in New Hampshire. Um, some groundwater levels in the region haven't really recovered yet, but they're on, it, looks, it looks promising, especially after tonight and uh, the Mother's Day event tomorrow. So <clears throat> if you recall, we did have a very big Mother's Day event in 2005 or 2006, Patriot's Day and Mother's Day event. So this is the time of year the uh, nor'easters tend to dump a lot of rain on us. So what's the apparent increase? In this case, um, at high latitudes, and that's what a lot of these uh, models were showing. I'm just going to go back to one or two. If you look at the high latitudes, where we are in New England and all around the globe, it's kind of a similar type of a, um, a reaction about what's going to be happening. So at high latitudes, we're going to see 10 to 40 percent more runoff by mid-century. And remember, mid-century is only 30 years away. I know it seems like a long time, but it's not. Infrastructure we're putting in today is expected to last well past that. Um, I know you can't read this, but many people have been studying this. So it's not only the temperature and the precipitation and the hydrology, but fire, wind, sea level rise, I haven't given a lot of uh, lip service to, uh, ocean acidification, responses to climate change, and species. All of these are going to be affected. So some of the key points, and again, this will be on the quiz, climate change uh, has already happened. And again, I'm not even talking about what may have caused it. As an engineer, 
This has happened, and we need to figure out how we move forward in design. Floods and droughts are going to be more common and more intense and cover larger areas. And again, we've already seen this. <clears throat> Precipitation runoff, and what you see is a figure of somebody holding hail. And those hailstones run the si uh, almost the size uh, of a baseball. Um, Precipitation runoff will increase in the northeast and midwest, uh, decrease in the west. So again, not everybody is uh, going to enjoy the hydrology and the precipitation we do. If you, know, if you remember, California just went through a five or six year drought. They were in ex extreme, extreme cases. Uh, my brother works for the uh, East May Bay Municipal Utilities District, which is uh, the east side of uh, San Francisco Bay. So they deliver water to everybody. And about 12 years ago, they uh, created, constructed a project to take excess runoff and put it into aquifers so they could pump it out later. They built the project and they've never been able to put excess water in the ground since they built it. So a few million dollars just sitting there waiting. I think this year they might actually start using it. Um, key points um, in areas where snowpack dominates, again, the timing is going to shift uh, closer to uh, uh, March and, and earlier. And the flows probably will be much lower come late sem summer because, again, uh, snow melt actually is very low intensity precipitation basically when it's melting. So a lot of that snow melt can get into um, groundwater recharge, which ultimately turns into base flow later on. So, <clears throat> um, Again, our common design life for our infrastructure is 20 to 50 years, although we'll have infrastructure over 100 years old because we don't, if it's working fine, we just don't replace it. And um, unfortunately, most of our infrastructure, like the people in this room, are baby boomer age. And what that means is our infrastructure, most of it is at or past the age of retirement. And so you've heard on the national stage of the need for infrastructure funding, and it's actually a tidal wave, as you'll start to see uh, uh, in some of the future slides. And this is not meant to scare you. It's just this is the reality. Not only Wolfboro, but almost every community across the US is facing this. After World War II, we had a phenomenal boom in population and subsequent infrastructure, and that was designed under completely different hydrology. And again, it's almost worn out now. And so we need to address that, let alone all the new infrastructure we're putting in. Um, this is uh, Kelly's Row in Dover. So, you know, when, when the Cochico flooded, here you have uh, them sandbagging to keep the water out of the bar and keep the um, alcoholics dry. <laughs> Don't ask me why. <laughs> they probably didn't even care. Um, so again, Hydrologic consequences, I've, I've mentioned most of these, but don't forget that the hydraulics go along with the hydrology. So when you have more water, more, higher velocities, higher depth of flow, more scour, um, it's just going to be much more challenging, not only for the physical environment, but then when you start to look at all of the organisms, flora and fauna that may live there, they're going to have to somehow adapt to this. And, you know, many of these... Um, uh, Organisms are able to move, and so whether it's a fish or other species, they may be able to be able to migrate into side channels and and hunker down and wait out the high flow periods. But other species can't, and the the species who can't get out of the way are going to be the ones who suffer first. And often those are on the bottom of the food web, and if they're not around, then the higher forms of life who could move out of the way aren't going to survive either. So how can we adapt? And uh, I'm not going to give you specific examples of what you can do here, but this is what some communities are doing already. So in Oregon, they're actually raising bridges to accommodate uh, port traffic and sea level rise. So it, in uh, the port of New Hampshire on, uh, on the seacoast and the Piscataqua River, we have a maximum mast height that can get under those bridges. And as sea level gets higher and higher, <clears throat> it's just going to be that the window in which you can ships, get ships in and out of that harbor will shrink because you'll only be get, able to get them in at low tide. And at low tide, again, that's going to require the shipping channel to be dredged and maintained much more frequently. Already, they're dredging it every three to five years. Um, 
design standards, um, I'm an engineer, and you, there may be engineers in the, uh, in the audience, so I can say this. Uh, we're a profession that are very reluctant to change. And we're also a profession which is basically driven by codes and regulations. And all of those change very slowly. So for example, we knew since the 1990s the precipitation was changing. But it took, and the data was available online to use for design, but it took almost to about 2006, 2008 until the state of New Hampshire adopted more recent climate-affected precipitation for design. So again, if the code doesn't change, as a profession, we're required to follow those codes, even though you know, we uh, know we should be doing something differently. So again, um, these design standards, codes, uh, need to change probably at a quicker, quicker pace. Uh, so just to break so I can change from one subject to another, um, I was working pretty far north in Alaska. And you're supposed to say, how far north were you? I was so far north, you had to go south on the Steese Expressway to get to the North Pole. That's how far north I was. So if you've ever been up to Anchorage, that's where I took this picture. Not Anchorage, sorry, Fairbanks, Fairbanks. North Pole is a town in, in Alaska. So now I'm going to switch gears to uh, water supply. <clears throat> for uh, It's a nice waterfall in Iceland. Um, water supply is basic, basically a supply and demand issue like any other commodity. And as far as the supply, when we're looking at water, it's precipitation, stream flow, groundwater. Those are the dominant sources. And when I say stream flow, that can include lakes, ponds, et cetera. It's surface water. And again, we may, may be getting wetter, so it would seem that the supply is getting larger. But again, we're going to have larger dry periods. So for example, if you get a weekly paycheck, and that switches to a paycheck every six months, you're probably going to be metering out that, 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 the, the withdrawals, the demands, a lot differently than if you get a weekly paycheck. So um, the, the supply variability is going to affect how we look at water supply, supply, and demand. And then on the demand side, demand is basically driven by population. So whether it's an industry, a commercial venture, or it truly is just uh, domestic water use, all of that ultimately goes back to the population. But again, on the demand side, we can't ignore the natural requirements of the environment. So in-stream flows, the fact that you need to have certain amounts of water in the lakes, ponds, and rivers for the aquatic organisms to survive. So that's a demand that we're including more and more when we look at studies. Um, so again, if you're looking at in-stream flows, it's going to be hard for anything to survive when you completely dry this up. And you think, this is New England. It doesn't happen here. Well, it does. In Massachusetts, they have streams where they've taken out so much groundwater that now the streams can actually dry up in summers. And it can happen here. Um, you think that we don't have water supply issues, that something like inner basin water transfers don't happen. They do. Wolfboro does an inner basin transfer, as I just was talking to Don this morning. You take water from the Saco River Basin, where you have your water supply pond, and it comes over into uh, this drainage basin. Uh, Durham takes water from the Lamprey River, water ba River Basin and puts it into the Oyster River Basin. We do that. We also do aquifer storage and recovery. So this time of year, you will take the high flows from the stream, put it into an aquifer. So you have stratified drift aquifers around here, and you could certainly use that strategy. If it wasn't for aquifer storage and recovery, uh, New Market and Durham probably would not have had water supplies last year. So. Um, these extremes are affecting us now. These aren't uh, just Western water issues now. They've, they've come to roost in New Hampshire. As far as infrastructure for water supply, uh, um, uh, Professor Kretschmer is going to talk about water supply as well, so I'm going to stay away from some of the, uh, his topics. But again, the infrastructure, <clears throat> when EPA looked at New Jersey, they need billions of dollars just to, again, upgrade their infrastructure. Uh, leaking pipes has led to sinkholes all over the country. Um, 
If you look at the city of Manchester, New Hampshire, this is a plot of the percentage of all the pipe length on the vertical axis that they put in the ground for water supply versus time. And it goes from 1869 to 2009. So you can see in the 1960s and the 1980s, they put in a lot of pipe. But again, they've got pipe, for example, from 1889 to 1899, over 100 years old, it's still in the ground. Some of these pipe could be wood, some of those could be asbestos cement, some of those could be lead. We're doing work in Philadelphia now, they don't even know where their pipes are. They know where some of them are, but they don't know where all of them are. And <clears throat> when these break, and this is a pipe picture of a pipe break in Manchester, again, when these break underground, you may not know immediately, they start flushing out the sediments somewhere, and then ultimately a cavity uh, uh, cre is created and they open up. So in a, what's not necessarily a large city by any means across this country, Manchester has 500 miles of pipe to, for their water distribution system. That's about 20 feet of pipe for every person in the city. And 17% of that pipe is over 100 years old. And it's still functioning and they know they have to replace it. So they used to try to replace two miles of pipe a year. That's not gonna cut it. They've gotta increase that to two and a half times to five miles, a year, five miles of pipe per year and again, just for Manchester, that's a, a few million dollars every year. They've got to start paying. <clears throat> so, um, um, again, I'm going to leave the water supply and now move on to uh, uh, stormwater, which was mentioned in the introductory um, remarks. And for stormwater, again, uh, I, I've been doing stormwater for decades. Um, we've seen a remarkable change in how we do stormwater management. Um, for centuries, it was rain and drain. As soon as it rains, get it away from the urban areas. And now what we're recognizing is, you know, the, the natural processes of infiltration did much better for not only minimizing flooding, but in, improving water quality. So. <clears throat> Where does it all come to? Uh, even famous comedians are talking about this, so it's not just me. Uh, Seinfeld's asking, you know, what's, what's happening? What's up with impervious surfaces? Well, when you pave over watersheds, as you obviously know from the name impervious surfaces, that rainfall can't penetrate the ground. But also, you don't get evapotranspiration. So what do you get? More runoff. And when you get more runoff with these paved surfaces, this is a little stream in Pennsylvania and um, Southampton Creek. And what you see is this little dam. And at the beginning of this storm, we, we were setting up to survey on a Saturday morning. And uh, we set up, and if you can see the timestamp, it started raining and the skies just opened up. And uh, we knew this dam was upstream, so at 1024, we uh, had walked upstream just to scope out the site, and this is what it looked like. We went back to the car, and uh, then the skies opened up. We walked back up, and about 11, just a half an hour later, this flood was just blowing over the top of this dam. So again, because you have the impervious, impervious surfaces, the runoff can reach the stream much, much faster, in part because we pump, we've plumbed it that way over the centuries. It goes from the curb to the gutter to the catch basin to the storm sewer right into the receiving water. And uh, what you see on this picture, and it may be hard to see, but you can see a river of water going down the sidewalks. Where's that coming from? Roofs and driveways, yes. But from all the lawn mowing, the lawns are almost impervious services as well. And then what you see is water coming down the gutter towards the catch basin, but there's so much water, about half of it bypasses out in the road right around that catch basin. And when that gets into the storm sewers, again, the storm sewers might have been designed with the rainfall from the 1930s which was pretty common up until about 1970, 1980. We used the rainfall from the 1930s to the 1950s to design infrastructure up until about the end of the last century. And so when you get too much water in these systems, the pressure builds up because they're overflowing. And here you see the uh, uh, storm sewers or the combined sewer lids popping off. And if you recall last year in Manchester, this happened on one and a young man was walking down the road at night and walked right into one of these and they found his body a few days later. So uh, it, when you go to the, some of the Seacoast communities, you will see the manhole lids either welded on or bolted on because again, the infrastructure is so old, it wasn't designed for all the impervious surface that we now have today. <clears throat> so is it a coincidence? Um, many of the effects of urbanization are also mirrored by climate change. So again, putting in impervious surfaces increases runoff. What are we seeing with climate change? More precipitation, more runoff. And that's higher peak flows, more intense runoff, and 
the effect in the streams. If you take a garden hose to the beach and you turn that garden hose on full blast, you know what's going to happen. You'll get an incision, an erosion in the sand. And as you'll see in a future slide, there's a balance between water and sediment everywhere. So in a natural stream, when you start putting more water into it, the reaction of the stream is going to erode, just like the hose on the sandy beach. And when you get the stream incising, it means it's downcutting. All of a sudden, it can't reach its floodplain anymore and, and push waters out on the front floodplain, which attenuates flood peaks. And so now what you do is you've aggravated this process. It just wants to keep incising, and it'll keep incising until it either hits bedrock or there's so much large boulders left behind that then it starts to widen. And now it's taking away your property. And this process is not going to stop. So it's not just that we have more runoff. Even if it was pure water, more runoff is going to disrupt all of our streams. And we're seeing that now. So <clears throat> the farther reason consequences, obviously, if you have streams incising like this, you're destroying the benthic community, you know, the macroinvertebrates, the algae, everything that's growing on the bottom. If they're not there, then every other higher form of life that feeds off of them, they're not going to be able to survive either. And then to compound that, if you think of what the stream looked like before in a cross section, and now it's down cut and widened, the geometry is very different. Instead of having a deep, slow moving stream, it may be really shallow and wide. And so with warmer temperatures, you're going to have less dissolved oxygen, and uh, it's easier for predators to get whatever species are in that sp said stream. So um, it's not only tough on us, it's tough for everything else. So, there are unanticipated consequences when we think about all these things. And if you can't read the, uh, the little comic, a lot of the comics I threw in here are just for entertainment. They have probably nothing to do with what I'm talking about. But again, these video games make kids violent, and the kids saying, hey, Frogger never made you leap into traffic. <laughs> so um, when we look at land use across the United States, when you take the census information, this is a plot of population density across the horizontal and the population in millions. By a large majority in this country, most of the country is suburban to urban. That's where most of the country lives. And as such, we have a lot of consequences to natural hydrologic processes. So this is, again, a plot of percentage of the time on the horizontal axis and stream flow on the vertical in just one stream. And what the effect of urbanization does, the blue line was the natural, basically it's a probability distribution. And when you start to urbanize, you see higher peak flows but lower base flows. So you kind of screw things up on both sides. You're creating more flooding localized, and at the same time, you don't have as much water in the stream anymore, whether that's for water supply, whether that's for um, um, uh, natural, natural systems. So um, this was a concept back in the 1990s. You have horizontal axis of stream impacts, and you have a vertical axis of the percentage of a watershed that's impervious. And this is pretty easy to do in GIS anymore. And the concept was, if you have a certain amount of impervious cover, you go from the green zone, which you have a nice healthy, rece healthy receiving water, whether it's a lake, a stream, et cetera. You go from that into the yellow zone, and that happens at about 10% impervious cover. The magic number, as some, some people call it. And <clears throat> if you get above 25% impervious cover, you probably have lost all of the natural properties, flora and fauna, in that ecosystem. So this was a concept. And since then, there have been dozens of studies which basically have verified this. It doesn't always happen at the 10%. Some watersheds, and this is one you can see a stream uh, water quality indicator on the vertical axis and percent imperviousness. In some watersheds, the lower end is about 5% impervious cover is when you're going to see statistically significant reduction in receiving water quality. Um, again, a lot of these are showing that a horizontal axis of impervious cover, vertical axis, some measure of stream water quality. The, as you get to 0% impervious cover, you typically have very high water quality characteristics. The more and more impervious cover, because you have not only the water, but the pollutants that wash off on that surface are getting into the receiving stream. And again, 
there's just a lot of studies now. And what we're trying to do with better stormwater management is try to undo this. So we're not saying we're going to take away your streets, your parking lots, your rooftops. But what we do is instead of rain and drain, as uh, I was talking to your public works director today, you have some posters here today and some of the consultants who design these projects, use green infrastructure, which basically not only filters the runoff from your impervious surfaces, but gives it time to infiltrate again. What that does is improve the water and, and reduce the effective impervious cover of the watershed. So we know as we increase the imperviousness, we move to the right. What we don't know, this is what we're trying to figure out, we know we get, uh, we're going to degrade water quality as we move to the right, but as we put in green infrastructure, it's probably hysteretic, meaning that we may have to put in a lot of green infrastructure before we start to see the receiving water um, recover. It's not going to go right back up that red line. And that's because you hit certain tipping points. And we have a watershed in Dover, uh, Barry Brook, uh, a lot of the information's online, about 200 acre uh, watershed. And it was 30% impervious cover when we started nine years ago. And by the end of the summer, we should have it down to the magic 10%. We have a, seen a dramatic change in uh, runoff. And I'll show you some of those slides in the future, um, in this presentation, not the future in my life. Um, <laughs> And, but we, so we can show dramatic changes in the hydrology, but the water quality is so variable, we can't statistically say it's gotten better, but it looks like it's getting better. So again, nationally, why is this important? Why is stormwater such a big issue? When the Clean Water Act came out, we really went after the point sources of pollution, pipes that were dumping right into receiving waters. But stormwater is diffuse, like agricultural runoff, and that's considered a non-point source pollution, NPS. And, and every year, no, sorry, every two or three years, every state has to report to EPA Santa's naughty list. This is known as the 303D list. And that list is basically the receiving waters that the state is monitoring that do not meet water quality standards. And so the 303D list, uh, actually New Hampshire's is just about to come out, the, the latest one. And so, for example, um, most of the streams and water bodies that are on the 303D list are now impaired due to, in part, stormwater runoff. So this is a big problem across the country. And these lakes right here are not immune to it. So you know, the more and more green infrastructure you put in, the, probably if you take home any message today, a no-cost way for you to do better stormwater management is just to adopt a better stormwater ordinance. And any new development that comes in just has to do green infrastructure. And therefore, you're not paying for it. The new developers are. Um, contaminated stormwater uh, discharges, again, are uh, affecting a, a significant numbers of the water bodies in this country. So uh, for Barry Brook, <clears throat> again, it's uh, on Santa's naughty list. It's a 303 de delisted stream impacted uh, uh, for aquatic life support, and it's uh, presumed to be due to stormwater runoff. And so in Barry Brook, we did uh, about 800 feet of stream restoration. I hope to get to that in the next two hours that I have. <laughs> and and um, I'm on slide like 27 out of 500, so I'm almost there. Um, so this is Upper Berry Brook, and at the top of this slide is um, Central Avenue, if you know Bay, uh, Dover, and above that is basically a 10-acre Hannaford's parking lot, and there's some other stores. That's the headwaters of Berry Brook, a parking lot. And then for over 140 years, Berry Brook was put underground because this is the site of Dover's water, tra tra water plant. And so Barry Brook was actually underground, and we daylighted it. So we daylighted about 800 feet of stream. And I didn't bring any of those slides today because I just don't have time. But this slide is basically showing you some of the locations where we put some of these infrastructures. This is all retrofit. And this is what communities are trying to grapple with now. How do you squeeze in green infrastructure after we've built everything up? And it's actually pretty easy. You take some calcium sub supplements, you grow a backbone, and you just look for the opportunities in your community. <laughs> yes, I am sarcastic, but there's always a, a thread of truth in that. So this is the watershed. And again, at the very top, you can see the parking lot. And the very bottom is the Cochica River. 
And um, it's a busy diagram, but basically on the horizontal axis, you have what falls from the sky. That's the rainfall. The vertical axis is basically the depth of water that ran off the watershed. Okay? And so if you had a one-to-one -one line, whatever came from the sky ran off. Now, the black line is how rainfall was converted into runoff when we had 30% impervious cover, effective impervious cover. And so I showed two lines where we hit 20% by putting in green infrastructure, and then last summer where you can see 14%. And so again, if you go in at one inch, what you see is that the amount of runoff keeps decreasing. And we've decreased it a significant amount. How significant, you ask? Um, I think that's on another slide. Um, but before I, I, I get to how, how much it decreased, um, Going along with the green infrastructure is also water quality improvement. So on the horizontal axis, and these slides, again, should be posted for you, but the Stormwater Center has a website, and uh, if you have trouble sleeping at night, go there. You'll find all this information. But we looked at all the different types of stormwater management from the left of the slide, swales and ponds, which is conventional infrastructure. In the center, you have manufactured green infrastructure. And then all the way on the right is the green infrastructure, bioretention systems, rain gardens, tree filters, gravel wetlands, porous asphalt. And uh, this is a slide, the vertical axis is the percent removal of total suspended solids. And you can see that the green infrastructure does really well. It removes 80% or more. For phosphorus, of which lakes are typically very concerned, <clears throat> green infrastructure does a decent job. And we've identified that you can actually get 80% or better phosphorus removal just by adding some simple amendments. One amendment could be zero virulent iron, but another could be the residuals from water treatment plant operations, which is typically a waste product called alum sludge. But if you just that, add that into the bioretention soil mix, you can get 80 to 90% phosphorus removal. Um, and then nitrogen, very few systems remove nitrogen because you have to do it anaerobically. And so not all systems are capable of doing that. Systems with things living in it can uptake some nitrogen, but they're only going to do that during the growing season. So, you know, up here you've got about six months of the year where they're not going to do that. Whereas the systems that have an anaerobic zone in them will do denit denitrification the entire year. So everybody does green infrastructure. You know? So after, after he was booted off of being the spokesperson for beer, um, he's moved on to doing uh, green infrastructure maintenance. But the point is, you're removing pollutants in these systems. And that means you've got to maintain these systems. The maintenance is actually easier and less expensive than the maintenance for conventional infrastructure but it needs to be maintained. If you build these systems, great, I applaud you. But if you don't, uh, if you don't maintain them, I'm gonna to have to give you an upside the head. You have to maintain these systems. <clears throat> so that moves me on to stream restoration. Uh, so I know uh, my friend Mitch is here from TU. Uh, if you never go fishing with Moses, it's just not a fun experience. So <clears throat> for stream restoration and uh, I know I'm going to be stopping at 10.15. Uh, for stream restoration, we know that there are certain metrics for healthy streams. <clears throat> and the other thing you have to understand for streams is that these stream systems are corridors for all types of wildlife. And we have to recognize that these zones are serving other purposes. And so I know you may have property right up to a lake or right up to a stream, but leaving that buffer is so important. I know it might block some of your view, but again, these are very important cor corridors. So again, it's been estimated that 70% of all terrestrial wildlife species use these corridors. Maybe not when you're looking at them, but they're using them. Um, just we're, we're kind of in a, a zone where the deer like to move. And uh, just yesterday, about six of them must have just gone right through my garden. I know they weren't there for the um, dahlias or the rose bushes. <clears throat> for avian species, again, these would be the flyways of migratory species from very far north all the way down to South America. And many of you, when you see the weather at night, you'll see the radar um, information. Well, radar is just sending up a signal into the sky, and even planes will backscatter that information. Birds backscatter scatter that information. And there's a whole field called radar ornithology. And you can actually track species and insects 
using radar signals. You just have to be able to tease out precipitation from, from species. And by and large, what people are identifying is if you track these stream corridors, you're going to be able to track avian species, that a lot of these species are dependent on that corridor. And why is that important is if we have excess stormwater or anything, <clears throat> either uh, destroying the stream or removing the buffer, you're going to lose the ability for these species to survive on these long migration routes. So that gets me to, so what the heck is stream restoration? Well, in the first place, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? So the first thing you have to figure out is when is a stream impaired? We know when our friends and neighbors are impaired, but streams, it's a little trickier. <clears throat> you know, with our friends and neighbors, we can just take away the keys, but for the streams, it's a little more challenging. So these are typical stream impairments. What we typically see is bank or bed erosion. We may see loss of habitat, uh, we, but we may not think about changes in hydrology, which can lead to an impairment. We don't think about disconnectedness. So when we put in culverts, that may actually prevent organisms from moving upstream and downstream. And by disconnecting the system, you've probably prevented them from accommodating or completing some of their life cycles. Um, and there's, you know, this Venn diagram. Stream restoration, bank stabilization, ecosystem restoration. And the bank stabilization is really infrastructure protection. The sweet spot is where the three interconnect. You know, you don't really try to do just one, but unfortunately, historically, um, bank stabilization has been armoring and, and we're not really even close to overlapping with either one of the other two. So, Streams can be thrown out of whack not only due to the hand of humans. So one natural event like a very large flood could send a stream out of whack and it could take a century for it to recover. So when Hurricane Agnes went up through Pennsylvania in 1972, many streams were disrupted and to this day they're still trying to adjust. Uh, I've gone over some of the systems, but again, here's an example. It's obvious that the outside of the meander bend is eroding, and if that's your property, you know, you want to stop that, especially if your house is right on the edge of that erosion. Think of the cliffs of California. In Santa Barbara, you have to, before you build on a property, estimate where that cliff is going to be in 99 years. You're not allowed to build within that zone. And then when that bank erodes, that sediment goes somewhere. That's causing a problem downstream. And so here you can see the deposition just downstream of some of the larger sediment that couldn't move. And those bars, as we call them, are just way stations for sediment. They'll move during the next one. So for stream restoration, there are many different types of stream restoration. And when I worked with the US Fish and Wildlife Service in Pennsylvania, half of our projects were just doing stream bank fencing to keep cows out of the streams. I mean, I don't know what's in their DNA, but whenever a cow walks into water, the tail goes up and they go to the bathroom. So, you know, just, just doing something that simple can really help out a stream. So again, there's this balance between water flow and sediment characteristics, and that's what these scales show. And what happens is these streams are in balance, and it may have taken them centuries to millennia. Remember, uh, depending on whether or not you believe the Earth is 4,000 years old or 4 billion years old, right here we had 10,000 years ago two miles of ice. And so a lot of what we see is actually young geologically. Typically what we want is everything to stay the same. And it's not going to stay the same. It's always on some path of change. So this is a stream restoration project in Pennsylvania, Quaker Run, and you can see how this stream has been channelized. And this whole area was mined land. So even the forest in the background, 80 years ago, this was strip mine. And there are over 1,000 feet of varying coal beds below this site. So there were surface mine. Down below, we had a, a, an underground mine, and the stream just went right into it. So. <clears throat> Um, I took that first picture in November. This picture was taken five or six months later, and you can see how the stream incised. And uh, this was a developer who was developing a site next to it and just moved this stream because the developer didn't think it was a stream. The state of Pennsylvania, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and um, the Corps of Engineers thought otherwise. So uh, what we did was, what you do with stream restoration is try to figure out good metrics. And so in this case, we take a, a nearby stream, which is hard to do in the mining district of Pennsylvania. 
Everything was destroyed. And you measure certain characteristics, the width, the depth, the meander ratio, all these things. And then you try to recreate a new stream. So this was a few months after we built the system. We also built a wetland to the side. And why you see the structure at the very bottom of this picture is I had two culverts in the middle of the project. And the culverts were not sized right. One was good enough, but two just stretched out the water too much so you couldn't get organisms passing through. And so I put this W-shaped or V double V structure in there. For most of the lower flows up to bank full, all the water goes on the right side. <coughs> and then when you get to the higher flows, it goes, <coughs> goes to the other side, as you can see in this slide. And um, there are structures in this stream. <clears throat> you may not see them, but every meander bend, there's a structure. And they're basically logs. So in small streams, you can basically hide these structures. And the structures are there just to hold the bank, deflect the water off of the bank, until woody vegetation can take hold. And the roots can then do the armoring for you. So again, this is a very vibrant system now. This is actually something called a... Um, um, a mud sill, mud has nothing to do with it, but it's basically an overhang where smaller organisms can get under it and just hunker down. <clears throat> and uh, you'd be amazed what it does for habitat. I never thought I'd see one, but uh, we, we pulled this rare Chiquita fish out of, out of that stream. <laughs> so uh, in my last three minutes, I have about uh, 40 slides to talk about human dimensions. <clears throat> human dimensions are us. And remember, our historic view of these systems, and this is global as well as local, transportation, <clears throat> food, energy, all the mills that are still around here, water supply, waste disposal. You know, um, it's hard to believe this, but this is a memo. The forerunner of New Hampshire DES was the Water Supply Pollution Control Commission meeting. And uh, they were looking at doing a um, <clears throat> wastewater treatment plant for Nashua. And the question was, you know, um, what do we have to do to treat this wastewater to put into the Merrimack River? And the last line says it all. Since the Merrimack River is used primarily for the disposal of sewage and wastes, and so we've come a long way since then, a very long way. But again, this is how we viewed our natural environment. Uh, here you can see a meander and a meander cutoff, how we straighten this. We did this all up and down the Mississippi, the Ohio, the Missouri rivers, so it would be easier for barge traffic to go up and down, which was the economic engine of this country for over a century, that river. <clears throat> Channelization, beautiful picture of armoring. <clears throat> Damming, all changes. Uh, culverts, it's really hard for fish to navigate to go upstream on a, on a culvert like this. Um, and here, this is the UNH campus. So here you have College Brook in the blue, and where you don't see it is where UNH has put it underground. And we're, uh, university, uh, military bases, communities are no different. And ultimately, up until about the present, we've viewed natural environment as infrastructure. Our rivers and lakes and ponds have been viewed as infrastructure. And we need to change that view. <clears throat> and the consequences of viewing it as infrastructure was you know, our claim to the domain over these natural systems. We will tame them. In fact, for the Mississippi River, the President of the United States told the General of the Corps of Engineers, go fix that river. They dammed it. They straightened it. They put in locks and dams because that's what was demanded by society. <clears throat> so, that leaves me with my last slide, and um, I think we're going to have a Q&A after, long after Dr. Uh, Kretschmer talks. I'm going to turn it over back to our moderator. <clears throat> So we're going to have a quick break, 15 or 20 minutes. Got snacks in the back, uh, which are important for keeping the spirits high for the, for the next section. Uh, we're going to start to bring it from the sort of global, statewide view back to the town of Wolfboro. Uh, Don Kretschmer is going to talk, uh, sort of key up the panel discussion that will come after. Uh, so, so have something to eat, and then we'll reconvene in 15 or 20 minutes. <laughs>